and the person who had the the sachet, he drew a box one day, and he drew a line from the bottom of the box all the way to the top. And then the line extended outside of the box. And the Prophet Sallallahu on the side of the lines, he wrote, or he drew more lines, Alayhi Salaam Salaam. So when he explained this to the Sahaba, he said that this line is the life of the human being. From the bottom of the box all the way up. And the bit that extends outside of the box, these are aspirations and dreams that this person has. But they will never, ever fulfill any of them. That could be one of us. We have all of these plans. He's saying, alayhi salatu wa salam, these are plans that you will never, ever carry out. But because you don't know what's going to happen in the future, all you do is plan. This is what I'm going to do. But lo and behold, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew that he would not be able to see and witness any of those things. As for the lines that he drew on the sides, he said, alayhi salatu wa salam, that these lines, they represent trials and tribulations that a person is going to be going through. And if he is saved from one sin, another one will overcome him. And he will continue living life like this until he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And life has to be like that. And we are not in paradise, we are in dominion. We are in, still in this world. But we are not free from trial. So in order for you to have a life that is a life of meaning, a life of substance, a life of ease, you have to sacrifice something for the sake of Allah. In the example I gave earlier, I was driving all over here. And I drove all the way here to meet brothers and sisters that I didn't even know who I was meeting, to be honest. It's true, I've been here before. But I've only been here once before. And I don't really remember anything in terms of like their names. I'm really and truly hoping I know the name of one student from this university. That studies here, I don't think I know most, except for the brother who just got here. I just found out his name now. But other than that, I didn't know. That's the simple example, not something huge. When you continue making the journey, you see the traffic. I'm driving on the motorway, and I see this motorway, and I'm saying the road, the side I want is busy. The side back to London is quiet. It is very easy to just turn around and say, just send a simple message to me and say, Mr. Sorry, you guys go home too, and I'll come home too, and everybody just enjoy themselves. Right? So we keep going. I don't know if anyone's still going to be here. It didn't cross my mind, by the way. When I get there, 45 minutes late, 50 minutes late, are there even going to be any students? Wallahi, I didn't ask them. I didn't ask them. When I got here, I asked them. But on my way here, I didn't know. A person is sacrificing. I'm not coming here because I'm going to get some money, because no one's going to give me anything. No one's going to give me anything, right? And I shake see, this is something simple for the dunya. What about Allah? And I spoke about this when I came here last time. What gives life to the heart of a Muslim, if you wish to give your heart life, is for you to acknowledge that you have a creator, a Lord that is so merciful to you. And he loves you so much, and he subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored you. The fact that he has allowed you to listen to his remembrance and for you to find your way back to him, this is him manifesting his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet he told us of a story. He said there was a man in a desert. He was alone by himself. And he lost all of his provisions. And he had no way and no path to find anything. And so in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with his provisions. And so out of so much happiness, he said, Oh, my servant, I am your Lord, and I wish to show you appreciation for what you have done for me. He called Allah his servant. And he said that he is the Lord of Allah. And he did that out of mistake. Because he was extremely delighted and happy. What's the point of the duration? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, look at how happy that man became. He was so confused. His screws became loose. Like he's calling Allah his servant. Confused man. But out of happiness, he said, Allah is even more happy that this man acknowledged that he has an Allah. He has an Allah. When you make Allah personal. He is my Allah. And he is my Allah. These are words that maybe we're not used to saying. But that's the Qur'anic music. That's how Allah speaks in the Qur'an. Rabbi. Rabbi. My Lord. He's the one who created me. And this dua that we make in the morning and the evening, or we should be making, it's called Sayyidul Istighfar. It is the most comprehensive dua that we seek forgiveness with. Allahumma anta Rabbi la ilaha illa anta. 
خلقتني وانا عبدك وانا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت هذول انت اللهم انت ربي الله فرست لا اللهم انت الرب او الله يو ار ذا لورد يس هي از ذا لورد بس يو او الله يو ار ماي لورد سو هي از ماي الله جست لايك يو ار هيز سيرفنت هي از لورد لورد از ذا يو 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 سي ذا الله جود لورد يو ار فاضي سي ذا لورد لورد هاز ميرسي يو ار لورد يو ار ميرسي نوت يو ار ميرسي ذا سيم او ماي لورد هاز ميرسي يو ار سي ذا يو ار سي جود سي ذا سيم جود سي They don't say, oh my God's sake, oh my, my, or even my God's sake, right? They don't say that. They know Allah to them, abstract. It's true, Allah. Now, Aslan, Allah Jalla wa'ala has become abstract even in their wording. My Lord, my God is absent. We don't say that. You know, Allah Jalla wa'ala, He has blessed you and honored you and given you so much and He has favored you above all of the other creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at how much He has given you right now. Just if you were to contemplate over yourself, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Allah Jalla wa ala, He created the son of Adam, man and woman, with 360 joints. 360 joints. He has made you different from all of the other creation. He has made you different from the animals. He has made you different from the trees and the stones and the rocks. He has made you even different from the angels that are better than us. Closer to Allah than us, there are 360 joints. The hadith says the son of Adam has. Ibn Adam, not the angels. Malaika don't have 360 joints. Some of them have a lot of wings, like Ibn. They don't have joints like that. Why did he give you this? In order for your life to be upright. Right now, you're all sitting down. I can see one brother. I'm going to say it because no one knows who the brother is. I'm not looking at any brother now because it's obvious. Right now, when I said that, he's, he was shaking his leg. I can see another brother writing something down. These are all your joints working at the same time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he didn't make you like a plank of wood that's just stiff and rigid, that can't move about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he allowed you to maneuver. So you can be a person who's independent from the creation, but you rely fully on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what tawakkul means. I don't rely on me. I don't rely on creation. I don't rely on people. I only rely upon Allah. So Allah gave me two feet so I can walk. Allah gave me two hands so I can use them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allowed me to have these different parts, these different organs, different body features. I have all of this in order for me to be able to better myself. In order for me to be able to better myself. And in order for me to be able to earn my paradise through this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave me a household, a family that are all Muslims. How many people are missing this? Again, you only realize when you go out to Jannah. Ask the people who's, who have come into Islam, who embrace Islam, the readers, ask them. Their parents are still not Muslim. Their siblings are still not Muslim. And they are worried. Are these people going to die like this of some disbelief? And brothers and sisters, you can't just continue living life and just study. Studying in university, having a career, getting married. And that's it. Is that what Allah really created us for? Allah is really going to create us for us. Because you are studying in order for you to have money so you can buy whatever you like and for you to have a future. Part of your future is the hereafter. Your future is not the next 10 years, 20 years, until you get married and you have children. Your future is the hereafter because that is something that you are heading towards. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's going to ask the people in your Qiyamah. What were you doing in the world for that entire time that I created you? When I brought you to my world, it's my world, I brought you there. What did you do? And some people will say, oh my Lord, we studied at the university and we had a career and we did all of these things and we made a lot of money. So then Allah will say, did I create you for that? Or was that meant to be a means for you to help yourself, but that wasn't the objective? And when Allah Jalla wa Ala, He questions the people like that, they have nothing to What's the point of this whole lecture? Maybe the people you saw don't understand the point of the way he's taking this. The point is, the same way you are invested, the same way you are dedicating time, the same way you are people that are searching and making an effort to earn your portion of this world, don't forget you have to earn your portion of the next world as well. There must be a time for this and there must be a time for that. And we have to fit it in. It's not correct. 
is shameful. It's something which is unfair. That a person of our age, nobody here is a youngster. Every single person here, Allah says about us, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظُونَ كِرَامًا كَافِرِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ Every single person around him, every single person here in fact, they have nobles, angels around them, writing and documenting every single thing you're doing, every single thing. يَعْلَمُونَ They know مَا تَفْعَلُونَ what you are doing. And they are sending it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your faith is on the line. And these angels are not like human beings. Right now, you may do something wrong to a person sitting next to you or a person here. Like for example, me, I came late, although it was accidental. I apologize, that's the right thing to do. Whether it was intentional or not. The good person has to do that, right? The angels, you can't just say, oh, sorry, angel, you have to uh, forgive me for not waking up the Please don't write that down. Have to know. Don't be heartless. It's an accident. Angels don't have the same brain as us. Angels, they do command it. Allah told them, if they do something wrong, write it down straight away. If they do something right, write it down straight away. And there's no discussion between you and the angels. You don't even see the angels. When are you going to discuss it? You don't even meet the angels, right? You can't see them. They're with us right now, but they're from the unseen. They're with you, they're with us. This room right now has so many angels that you see in the house. So if a person were to see the unseen, this will make them steadfast. This will make them a person who never ever deters from the path of Allah. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, if you were to hear the cries of the one who's in his grave, being punished inside his grave, you will cry so much that you will pass out. You will become unconscious. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, all of the creation of Allah, they hear the cries of the one that's been punished in the grave. Illa insan except for man. If you were to hear it, you will become a person who falls down and comes straight away. Out of Rahman to you. And this will disturb your entire life and ruin your entire life if you were to hear it. For Allah is testing you. You don't see Jannah. You don't see Jahannam. You don't see the angels. You don't see Allah. But you have been told you are going to be resurrected after the death. You are going to meet Allah. Even if you were in the earth millions and millions and millions of years, you were living here, then millions and millions and millions. Of you are under the underground. After all of that, Allah will just command the angel one time to put life into your soul once again, and you will come out of your grave and you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the Prophet said that he told us that the angel who has been given this task, he has already put his lips on the trumpet already. 1400 years ago, he put his lips on the trumpet, and he's looking at the sky, waiting for the command. As soon as Allah says, blow, you will blow. And it's as easy as that. And nobody will be given a second chance. No one from among us will be given a second chance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that there's going to be a book of records here on Qiyamah. The Quran told us this. This book of records, it is going to have within it every single thing that we did. Every single little thing and every single big thing will be recorded in this book. They will find what they did, how they are present before them. And you he doesn't wrong anybody of the hundred. Imagine, however, after hearing all of that, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how expansive it is. It has encompassed everything. My mercy has encompassed every single thing. A person hasn't been practicing for most of his life. So many shortcomings. You know yourself very well. But because Allah knows you even more than you know yourself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has given a person a golden opportunity. That you can live a life of Moses your entire life. And in the final moments, if you do the right thing, that will wipe out all of the years of nonsense that you came with, all of the years of mistakes that you came with, all of the years of sins and missing prayers even, you will wipe it out. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Yu'ta bi an'ami ahli dunya. The person who had the most ni'mah, the most blessing, the best type of life, worldly life that is, dunya life. From this world we will go to Allah Qiyamah. But this person is from the people of the fire. So he lived the best of this world. They were the richest person. They had the best of things. Uh, you name it. Everything that you can imagine, they have. But they have been destined to be from the people of the fire. This person will go to Yom Al-Qiyamah, Prophet ﷺ, he said, and ghamsatun wahida, they'll be dipped into Jahannam just one time. This is the person who lives the best life in the dunya. 
there will be thoughts that have you ever, do you ever remember like you having a good life in the dunya? It will manifest like that. One dip in Jahannam will make him forget his entire life of dunya. And he will say, No, oh my Lord, la, wallahi la. He will say, Oh my Lord, no, by Allah, no. I forgot about everything. To show you the reality and the severity of Jahannam. And the opposite. The person who has a most difficult life, a life of hardship, agony, pain, trials, tests, a person who really suffers in this world. Maybe a few names come to mind whilst you're hearing this, right? Maybe your own family, maybe yourself, maybe your friends, maybe other people. People who have really suffered. But they remain steadfast. They realize that I'm either going to take a blow here or the blow there. I'm either going to cry about my pains here, or I'm going to cry forever in the next life, where there's no mercy. Either I'm going to get up after falling down right now, or I'm going to stay down in this world and then I'm going to face even further consequences in the hereafter. So they push through, and they persevere, and they had sorrow, and they had patience. This person will be put into Jannah just one time, one dip, and they'll be taken out. They'll be told, do you remember any hardship? They had the worst life. One dip in Jannah will make them forget all of the hardship they had and they'll say, no, oh my Lord, no. By Allah, no. We don't remember any hardship. So for you to always remember your hereafter, for you to always remember your eternal abode of residence where you're going to stay forever. And this world has too many distractions as it is. Continue doing what you are doing so long as it's halal, right? So long as it's halal, and it's good for you. <coughs> but remember, إِسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ have reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do that which benefits you and continue doing that. Continue doing that. Ask Allah for sabat. Ask Allah, it's going to be very hard, but ask Allah, Allah help you. Make me a strong person. A strong person. That I can keep doing this for a long time. I can keep waking up for salah every single day for the rest of my life. Oh Allah, make me like that. I come with a new day. And remember, so long as you do this, inshaAllah ta'ala, even if you make mistakes here and there along the way of your journey. I made mistakes. An example, a human being like today, I'm just traveling now. I missed, I missed a few turns. That's not why I'm late, by the way. There was a lot of traffic in me. But I did miss a few, one or two, I think, on the way here. It doesn't matter. You get there in the end. Someone. In that, I managed that example. I got here in the end, alhamdulillah. In one piece, alhamdulillah. And I hope I go back in the future. Well, happy. Is that? So, inshallah ta'ala, I don't really have much to say. The main uh, niya that I came here with was to just give our brothers and sisters salam, salam alaikum, it's a bit late now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And it's for me to just give myself a reminder. These are, I think, words that I needed to hear uh, more than everybody else. And uh, perhaps if what was in my heart is to be revealed to you, I'm probably the one who's the most attached to this world, more than anyone else who's sitting here. And Allah truly knows best. But I needed to hear those words from myself. May Allah grant me the aid and the strength and grant you the aid and the strength as well. And uh, I think if there are any questions that you may have, uh, you can ask them. I don't want to keep the reminder too long because I'm aware of uh, you already being here for so long. I don't want to bore you any further than that. Are there any questions from the brothers or the sisters who are here? No questions? My question is that Let's say you start this gay class, gay class with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and like start speaking Allah with them, start doing more Quran, more, more, more Nafi Salah, start, you start getting burnt out and like, you, you try to keep consistent and like, so it's just like too much. Like, how do you keep that fast? Or do you have any tips? Uh, our brother, he said that he was going to try to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trying to be consistent, how can he avoid uh, being burnt out, right? Uh, you ask Allah to first and foremost, the same way you ask Allah to make it easy for you to work with him. You ask Allah to grant him joy within him. You see, a person who finds joy within worship, they don't find it burnt out, you know that. Prophet ﷺ, he would pray for so long until his feet would become broken swollen, he will feel pain. That's now a stage beyond burnout. That's physically enduring pain. <coughs> Anas, his companion from the Sahaba, 10 years he was with him. 
And they say, you are like the people you hang around with, right? Anas radiallahu anhu, he started praying the Qiyam al prayer. His feet not only became swollen, his feet started bleeding. Where's the burn of it? And they find sweetness in it. Prophet he said, Hubbiba ilayya min dunyakum atribu wa nisa wa ju'inat qurbatu aini fi salah. What has become beloved to you from your dunya is women and also fragrance, smell. Prophet it's not very good. You guys have to show you smoke good as well, inshallah. <laughs> he smells good all the time. There's no such thing as B.O. or bad or blah, or no. And they say, subhanAllah, they didn't have the fragrance and the, the sophisticated oils that we have today, let alone deodorant. They didn't have all that stuff. They didn't have food, they were simple food. And even the herbs, you could say that it was just very simple herbs. Even you know, the herbs today that look a little like a stick of herbs, they said it came from some tree in Arabia. They give it to them, they put it on their finger, and they say, that costs ten thousand dollars. That's what we have today. The people still smell. They don't know why. <laughs> That's the point. The point is, the Prophet he said, after that, would you add that Qurba to Aini of Salah? But the coolness of my eyes has been made with prayer. This was manifested by the Prophet. He's not just saying that. That's the word. Where's the application? Cool, Bilal. Bilal is his mother. He said, Arihna biha ya Bilal. Bring comfort to us, O Bilal, and cool that way. So I can give you a simple answer and say, oh, just you make a time for you, make a routine, or don't do too much, you don't be burnt out. I can say that, but I don't have sleep on the day because you probably have that before. You have to pass the burnout stage and not even experience burnout in your life. By not avoiding burnout, by skipping burnout, going to the stage above burnout, which is joy. If you have joy, the burnout will even become numb. Prophet is a human being. When his feet is becoming swollen, you think he can't feel it? He can. He's a human. Anas, when his feet is bleeding, he's not aware. He is aware, of course. But he, why is he not stopping? I really want to ask themselves this question. They're human beings, just like you are a human being, they're a human being. They're no different. When his feet is bleeding, why is he not stopping? Then that he can't. That's basically it. He cannot stop. It's not a burnout or an unburnout. It's for him, it's joy, sweetness, pleasure. If I can do this my whole life, I can see what it is. That's what it is. Likewise, another way to understand this. There's things that we can do without burning out. Everyone knows themselves. Some people, they can just sit with their friends and just talk to them, just keep talking, just keep talking. Even if you don't say, but even see your mom, the most beloved person to you, right? Okay. Really and truly, your mother is the most beloved person to you. That's one thing. Don't put that to the side. But you are a human being. Why are you, why are you just like able to just keep going? It's not only because it's your mother. It's because of the love. You see what I mean? Here, they love this action. Whatever you love, you can keep doing. If you love something, you won't stop. So you'll pass by now and you'll find joy. And it'll be something that you just keep doing for you. You won't know anything else. That's how you operate. So may Allah give it to us. It's a very high level. Uh, but it's not impossible. And if you make dua for it and you try to attain it, then you like to will surprise you. So I think that's a decent way. I don't think it's maybe the best way, but it's a decent way to answer that question, inshallah ta'ala. And uh, look past that now, inshallah. There's a higher stage. And it's called al lazza al-Ibadah. You need to find lazza and sweetness and joy in your life. Who for amongst us? Ask yourself the question today, why do you just do? When you pray today, not just yesterday, or just today when you pray, Asr, Allah, or Allah, or Fajr, or Sunnah, you find so much sweetness. Did we find it? Maybe most of us did. Did we find it yesterday? This week, this month, this year? Have we ever experienced it? Maybe some people even in Ramadan they don't experience it. You have to know that I'm, I'm missing. There's something missing in my life, genuinely. As some of the Sahaba, you'll be surprised the way they, they, they devoted themselves in Ibadah. This thing about burnout doesn't exist. But I think there's a, a very lofty level that can be attained for the one who seeks it, inshaAllah. Any other questions from the brothers and sisters? Life, you see 
uh, Ibn Jawzi, there's a great scholar by the name of Ibn Jawzi. He has a book called Sayyid al Khatir. And I think the name is called Capture Thoughts, although I haven't seen the English part. He says that there's a lot of people who are attributes of knowledge scholars, and students of knowledge, and imams, and people like that. And he says that these are people who really lost out. Imagine you think people of knowledge have lost out. He's explaining, he said, because they failed in two areas. One area is al khalawat times of seclusion. So when they're with the people, it's okay, they're okay. But when they're at home behind posters, behind the curtains, they're bad people. <coughs> and the Prophet said, we spoke about this. He said, there's going to be a group of people who come. They are your brothers. They pray like how you pray, and they fast like how you fast, they have a portion of the night, and he explained all the attributes. When I came, he said, they are a home, a group of people. If they become alone, their only issue is when they become alone, with the limits that Allah set, they violate everything. They engage in haram all of the time. They don't care about Allah Jalla Allah watching over them. Their only concern is whether people can see me or not. Allah can see me as He wants. I'm going to still do this. And Allah Jalla Allah can just watch until I finish my time. So there's no concern, there's no respect, there's no honor. You see? There's no care. But because of this, they can't be steadfast in the real life. So it goes back to this. He's saying people of knowledge, there are people out here. The Prophet is saying they pray, but they don't, they don't have this. But what do you, what you do in your private affairs and your internal state, having your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala planted deeply in your heart, this is the main thing. Inshallah ta'ala will make us steadfast. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will include you in your blessings. Yes. Go ahead.
there by accompanying people who have, who, who know of my righteousness. Accompany the righteousness. How many friends do we have that wake up off of the bed? How many friends do we have at our age that help us memorize the Quran? You know, that give us that support. I want to ask you a question yourself. What do you study? What do you study? I think every single girl, one, two, three, four, five, you said five minutes or something. I want to ask the five brothers again. There's a minimum of minutes. Um, do you have brothers that help you? Or in the study, in the group study? Definitely. Yourself? Yeah. 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 Everyone, right? Yeah. I'm not going to ask this question. I'm going to come next. But now, they're studying for something, right? It's doing a thing. Uh, they have people to help them. We all do. Family. How many people do we have that help us with our deen? I'm not saying nobody does, but I'm saying a lot of us we have more people than many of us in the deen. That's the best of us. And the worst of us we have zero in the deen and we have so many in the video. You see? Why we're falling behind now? It's because of the deen. But if we have people that pushed us, pushed us to our potential and beyond, I said, Ahi, keep going, keep going, don't stop, keep going, keep going, keep going. Now you know that you're a servant that Allah loves. Now you love Allah. Your question was, how can I build my love for Allah in other ways outside of studying? When I have this individual now that's helping me, I understand that Allah sent him to me. And they're helping and helping and helping me, and they don't even do that. They genuinely don't need to do any of that. Why did they have to do it for me? They have to just work out on themselves. They're helping me so much. That means Allah wants me to be a good person because He sent a good person to me. فَأَنَا أُحِبُّ اللَّهَ I love Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's Rahim. He's very especially merciful. That's what Rahim means. So accompany the righteous people. That's one benefit. Another benefit when you accompany the righteous people is you won't fight any time to do bad. That's a big benefit. Because right, righteous people don't make you do bad. Righteous people make you do righteous things. Right or wrong? Right or wrong? Because I'm talking to the brothers and they're all listening. Uh, just, you can ask them. Put the more brightest friend you have in your head. You got him in your head? Okay. Has he, has he ever told you to do bad? No, nah, now you okay. Now you okay. I'm not saying that you've been together and you won't do bad. Maybe you've done a mistake. But he won't command you to do bad. Because automatically his righteousness is in him. I've come here now. My lecture is about Iman, Islam, Quran, and reminding of Allah. If I come now and I do other than my job, automatically I've lost that what I have. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for the truth. <coughs> what I explain? So we need to keep ourselves close to the good people. And the Prophet said, he said, a believer will be resurrected with who he is with. In another narration, who he loves. If you love the good people, you'll be with the good people. If you are spending time with the good people, you'll be with the good people. A brother came to me just the other day in London, and he said, I used to be a person who used to do all types of harm, fahsha, and filth, things that are not allowed. So he said that the, what helped me is a brother who literally, literally just gave me his time. He kept encouraging me, he kept helping me, he kept advising me, he kept telling me good things, he kept telling me that this is not what I'm meant to be doing. And he would say it in the most understandable way, non-judgmental way, that he started making me love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I didn't think I would ever be the person I was today if it wasn't for that person. And I didn't even ask for him to come. He just came. Allah sent him. What's the point? He's admitting that his, his higher life changed. This is a beautiful way of helping. And he said, you are from the religion of your friends. Choose your friends wisely. Maybe just take that advice again that I said earlier, which is, how many friends do you really have that are helping us in goodness and righteousness? Your level of righteousness is going to be in accordance with your righteous fellow, fellow people around you. They say that you are as fast as the slowest person in your circle. The slowest person who is not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your you are just like them. So that means if your best friend doesn't pray Fajr, that's what it means, and you're praying Fajr right now, it's very likely that soon you're not going to pray Fajr anymore. Soon. Allah can give you step on if Allah rules otherwise. If Allah rules otherwise, Allah rules otherwise. But the way it's looking, it doesn't look like that. You do not have a strong support system around you. Ask the Arms that question. Keep yourself around good people, inshallah. And remember this. You rather Allah be a loner. By a 
us out from this world and have that in front of us. Because it's three options. Good people, bad people, burn us out. The last two are not good. Bad people are not good, for sure. And being alone is also not good. The Prophet said that in being that the, the wolf takes advantage of the lone sheep, the shaitan takes advantage of the lone believer. So it's not an option. But if I have to choose between bad people and being by myself, it's much better to be by yourself. So the rank would be good friends, by myself, bad friends. Bad friends are your option. <laughs> That's what I think I should change it. Good friends, by myself. And I'm saying that bad friends, whether they're Muslim or whether they're not, it's all the same. It's all the same. For like example, if you're good people with bad, bad friends, stop. What do I mean by bad friends? Is why I mean mentally for the last 15 years of righteousness. A taqwa. Prophet said that a taqwa is a When you shiru ila sadrihi thalata marwa, you surrender to Muslim. He pointed to his chest three times and said, taqwa, tie it to the ear. It is a chest. You don't know what it is. It's something that you can wear. It's not a bullet that you can throw up. You can sense it. I can feel it. It has remnants. It has, it has an impact. Uh, have these people around you, inshallah. There was a companion by the name of Abu Dhabi. Uh, his wife heard him in the prayer making dua in prostration for over 300 friends by name. So she said, You have 300 friends. He said, How do you know I have 300 friends? She said, I overheard you in your sujood saying their name one by one, one by one, one by one. The sujood making dua for their friends. Those are the group of friends that you need. One thing that he did is look, make dua for your friends by name, in sujood. And then secondly, his wife can hear it. That must be a very a heartfelt dua from the heart. Because normally sujood you whisper, right? You don't shout. I don't think you shout, he's a companion. But there must be some love there. That's what you need to talk about. Uh, may Allah grant it to us. Any other questions? Like you, for you for being friends like that. Well, it's 
a beautiful thing for you to do in the presence of Jesus. And the last thing I'll say to the sister, I'll ask the question is, from what this woman is saying, that some people will create the bad people you see, to do good actions for other people. So they've been created to do salah, siyam, fasting, trying to read the Quran so other people can think they can read. Because at the same time they do bad, they slander, they insult, they curse, they backbite. But whilst they're doing good, they're also doing bad. But all the good they're doing is going to the bad people. You know how the scholars explain it? They say you have a canon. The canon, you load it with your good deeds. And then you shoot, right? Who are they shooting at? They're shooting at the people that they're doing bad towards. What are they shooting with? Their good deeds. So brother, I have prayer, I have this, I have this. And then Allah forbid, I say something bad about this brother here. Brother X. So brother X now, I'm shooting him. With my own good deeds, he's taken. So he will, if he sees the good deeds, he, will, he wants that. Look, I was telling brothers in another club yesterday, somewhere he was in the class, he said, last night I was talking about Hajj. A lot of the brothers are doing Hajj now. May Allah Allah will talk to you. So I was saying, you know, um, there's a hadith that says, whoever does the five pillars of Islam and doesn't even add anything to it, they'll go to Jannah. Put your hand up if you have this hadith. If you just do that only. So a few people have heard it. If you do the five pillars of Islam, that's it. And you don't add to it, you go to Jannah. I can find it after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said yes. So then I said to everybody, what does that mean? That means Islam is easy. That means Islam is uh, something that we, uh, we can do, it's achievable, it's manageable. I said, look at how the shaitan gets you. You're saying that it's easy because it's just the five pillars. You don't have to be on a share or go to the university, right? How many of you have even completed your five pillars? Yeah, to show you that this wasn't an easy thing, it's a hard thing in fact. It is a hard thing. It shows you because the evidence is here. I asked them yesterday, who has who done Hajj here? The group of brothers that I was with? No one said. So I said, if you die right now, you can't even get that hadith, let alone the other hadith. <laughs> so the shaitan is telling you, it's an easy thing. If it was easy, you would have done it. The religion is a religion that's practical, but it's not easy to, to make it easy for you. It's a practical thing that is achievable. And it's easy for the one who Allah makes it easy for. And it's hard for the one who Allah makes it hard for the practical side. That's the correct answer. That's the answer, okay. The answer is we keep trying, employing different methods, inshaAllah ta'ala, be there for them, be a genuine person, spend time with them, and try to just make them peace and and make dua for them, inshaAllah, when you forget to make dua for our companions. Make dua for them, make dua, Allah Mahdiha, Allah Mahdiha, Allah Masliha. Oh Allah, rectify her offense. Oh Allah, guide her. Oh Allah, help her. Another question? I don't think so. I'm not going to do that. Don't mind. Unless that sister went away, wasn't she? They clapped her. I saw her hand. It was me that dropped the tape. Yeah, see, I was sure I saw her. Any other brothers? Yes, last one. What does it mean to do Tazabur of the Quran? What does it mean to do Tazabur of the Quran? That's an entire lecture. Or a course, uh, but tazabur in brief it means to stand over the words of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in awe of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and with a heart that seeking guidance from His words. In awe of Allah Subhanahu to stand over Allah's words in awe of Allah, meaning the author. There's two parts of tazabur. You don't do tazabur over words and you not do tazabur over who said the words. No need to tazabur over the word over the one who said the words and forget what he's actually saying. So you do tazabur over the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in awe of Allah. And seeking that which is going to bring your heart purity from it. That's in brief what tazabur means. And that's the main reason why the Quran was written. So your heart to find the purity and to, to, to be in awe of who Allah is and the subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Quran is amazing. It has a lot of amazing things. Person was to dedicate some time to study it properly or authentically, and had some time go by. If you live long enough, then they will learn a lot from the Quran. Imagine if your whole life you just read it, you just have a life of reading the Quran, learning the Quran, every day learning more about what Allah says. Every single day, your heart is opening up more, warming up more.
I think you're going to have to go on the motorway. So you can just go home from there, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for you. You want to be easy in your exam, in your studies, and uh, whatever you wish to recite, may Allah bless you all your exams. And you're going to be a good family, a good, uh, wise, good husband, good child, and you're going to be wise, good husband, good children. Why are you laughing, bro? Good wives, good husband is correct, right?
the mum has three times the boy. So you're thinking, even if I'm going to come later, at least give me double so I can pass. Or give me three times, maybe four, five, six, she was one, two, three, maybe in number four, number five, number six. So I can come after the mother, but I have a good Shia. The religion said no. The mother has three times, you have one time, and you are still at the end. But the man didn't say nothing. To show you, this is a fitna. And the fitna of the sa'ah, when the time of Qiyamah comes close, Muslim Abidjan, do you know what he said? He said a lot of things. He said, it's going to start into a new lecture now. He said, from Ashratu Sa'ah, from the, when the signs of the hour comes close, is what? That the woman, she will give birth to her master and tell them, Amatu Rabbataha. So she gives birth to her child, and this child is a child that now is a master for the parents. So some of the scholars say, if you are a person who scares your parents, you frighten them, your parents are scared of you, you yourself are a sign of your own. If you scare your parents to the point where they're scared and frightened of you, you are a sign of your own So the religion told us that this is something that Allah gave the woman and above the man. Likewise, the things that Allah gave the man above the woman. And Allah said, with the and the men they have a degree of station above the women. But the women have a station above the men. The women are the mothers of the Imam. Sah, Allah never made a prophet. That's a woman, right? So maybe a person who doesn't believe in Islam, who is a female, will say, I don't have an issue with that. But we say that the prophets, all of their mothers, are the ones that were reading that they became prophets in the first place. The woman has a high status, the mother of the Prophet. Ali, mean, she, what kind of right? There's no. You can't even speak about it. So the women, they have a station, they have a high station. Going back, the Prophet mm -hmm. is second, the mother is third, the father is third. This is the rank that the baby was told by the two parents. Later on, the father, he became very sick and unwell and bedbound and he couldn't leave the house. And people started visiting, coming around the home and making dua and saying, May Allah grant you shifa, etc. So the baby saw people coming around the house and making dua for his dad, saying, May Allah give you shifa. So he asked his mother, he said, Isn't this Allah, this is baby? Isn't this Allah the one who you told me that I should love more than everybody else? You, I told you earlier in the lecture, a baby is understood. Mahabba, he loves Allah. He said, yeah, this Allah that they're making dua to, to grant your father a cure, it is the Allah that you're going to love before everybody. He said, if it's the Allah that I'm going to love before everybody, I want to send this Allah a letter, and I want to ask Allah to give my dad a cure. So he went to his mother and he said, can you help me write a letter to Allah? And because she was feeling sad and emotional and down, she agreed. And they sat down together, they got a piece of paper, they got a pen, and they wrote a letter to Allah. Dear Allah, Baba Marim, Dad is sick. We want you to cure him. This is from Muhammad's family. They put it in an envelope, they put a stamp on it, they mailed it, and the letter going to Allah. It's a real story, it happened in Cairo. So then the next day, when the postman, they got hold of the letter, they saw a letter addressed to Allah. And they said, where do we take this letter? <laughs> Literally to Allah, and it's stamped and everything. <laughs> Imagine that. And that's the whole reason why we know the story, because they came with the media. So they were confused. So they must have decided to open the letter and to see what's inside. So they saw the details of the house and the family and the handwriting of the baby and all of that. So all the media came and took pictures of it went all over the news. So a man who had love for Allah, look, all of them love for Allah, who had love for Allah and his religion, he saw it and he, he went to the house. And when he went to the house, he saw the mother and said, where's the baby? He said, the baby's back there. He said to the baby, he said, you know the letter you sent to Allah, the one that you mailed, you posted? He said, yeah. He said, Allah received it. Allah received it. Obviously Allah received it, but not literally. You talk to a person, it goes back to what the sister up there asked as well. You talk to a person on the level they understand, this is a baby. The baby doesn't even understand what's going on. Allah received it, meaning Allah knows about it. And he said, Allah received it and Allah sent me to give your father a cure. So Allah will cure him. And he's teaching him aqeedah, principles of Islam. He's saying, I can't cure. I have the medicine. Allah gave you the medicine. 
I'm going to give him the medicine, but Allah will cure him from that. Right now, you're, you're, from the onset, you're connecting his heart to Allah. You could have said, I'm going to cure him. No, you don't cure anything. Allah cures him. So he took the father, he took the lady, and he took the father, and he took him to the hospital, and he began his uh, giving him the medicine and all the rest of it until the, the father became healthy once again. And then they discharged him in the hospital, and they went back home, and the baby, he grew up later to be a big scholar of Islam. Why? Right from a young age, the only thing they said is, Allah is the one that you should love the most, and they manifested that in his life. They manifested that in his life. And he knows who Allah is from a young age, before the heart got contaminated by this world, and the filth, and the nonsense, and all of these things are, doesn't make sense. Nothing can get in the way of the fitrah. If in the beginning it's not contaminated, Every single newborn is upon the right path. It's his two parents who mess him up. So these two parents, they didn't mess him up, they helped him. So Allah, you have widani, you owe you nasirani, you owe you mentisani. His two parents make him a person who follows the dunya or atheism or kufr or disbelief or whatever. These two parents, they raise a child of peace. That's a beautiful story. Just like that child of Adam, we should be like that. And I said that was going to be the end. You'll see the back of me, so inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to go. So don't look at my back. Just inshallah ta'ala. And you go home as well. And we're going to go to the safe journey, inshallah. And uh, Ramadan, you're going to be the most and protect you.